Everyone. And today I will be discussing about some of the uh, recent studies and the uh, developments in field of organ transplant, especially the kidney transplantation. And uh, uh, before going for uh, these topics, I will just uh, outline my presentation. Uh, one of the important aspects of the organ transplant is the availability of the organs. So there is a shortage of the organs and only very few of few patients, less than 5 to 10 percent of the patient, they actually received a transplant because of the organ shortage. And in India, this figure is even less. Only about 5,000 of the patients out of more than 200,000 who require the transplant, they actually get the kidney transplant. There are two ways to increase the pool of the, uh, to fulfill this deficiency. One of them is the zero transplantation, that is a transplantation from the animals to humans. And another is by the way of bioengineering, means making the organs by the help of engineering. A second important aspect is the transplant tolerance. Normally, the, any, any person who is receiving an organ from the uh, other uh, human being will need some uh, immunosuppressive medicine to prevent the rejection. Uh, but with, uh, these immunosuppressive medicine, they have their own side effect and one of the ways to overcome this is the, by the help of T regulatory cells, uh, which I will discuss in short about the uh, role of these cells. Very uh, uh, important uh, problem in the transplantation is the uh, problem of rejection and because of that, there is a long term survival of the transplanted organ is affected. And now there are many researches going on for the biomarkers by which we can actually diagnose this rejection earlier and maybe do some intervention at that time so that we prevent the development of the clinical rejection. There are some new molecules, some of the old molecules which have come up like co-stimulatory blockers, there are some new research in that and there are uh, some newer drugs which are being developed for the rejection. So let me come to the xenotransplantation. So xenotransplantation as you are aware that xenotransplantation means the transplantation from the animals to the human. And this has been actually the most common animal which has been used for this is the pigs. But there are two problems. One of the problem is the severe rejection. When the organ is transplanted, in the earlier time uh, from the pigs to the human, there is a severe rejection which can occur. And the second problem is the uh, viral infection because these pigs, they contain the various uh, virus and which can actually uh, come up, come with the transplanted organ and cause the severe uh, infection and the patient can die of this infection. So uh, this is a new technique which is called the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system which stand for clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. <clears throat> so this is a gene editing technique in which there is a guide, there is a sequence of RNA which is called the guide RNA which is attached to an enzyme. This guide, function of this guide RNA is to target a sequence of DNA in a uh, virus or in a cell which has a defective genes. So this actually this is this system is found in the E. coli bacteria which uh, has been developed as a to uh, protect them from the viruses. So this guide RNA will find a sequence of DNA and then this sequence of the DNA with the help of the enzymes will be uh, sliced off from the uh, that uh, part of the genome and then this gene or this will become defective. Uh, uh, that's, that is the principle of this uh, technique and this has been one of the most uh, talked uh, or most uh, science discovery in uh, last two years. And this has been uh, used in many diseases like one of the important application in the uh, cancer where you can actually identify a particular gene and make it uh, uh, inactive. How is it useful in patient with, uh, for the xenotransplantation? As we know, uh, pig cells under the uh, condition of the stress, they produce a porcine endogenous retroviruses. 
and these porcine endogenous retroviruses they are actually uh, uh, they are basically produced by two or three genes and when uh, we apply the system CRISPR Cas9 system this gene just identify a portion of the DNA which is responsible for the making of these endogenous retroviruses and as you can see that this uh, binding and slicing will inactivate the gene which is called the pole gene and as a result of that when this organ is transplanted from the pigs into the human this will not cause the uh, uh, infection with the viruses. So Yang et al had uh, demonstrated that he was successful in inactivation of 62 active per uh, porcine endogenous retroviruses with the help of these techniques and uh, but there is there are certain uh, issues with these techniques that uh, the overall efficacy of the gene inactivation with these techniques ranges only from 30, 20 to 30 percent means it is not entirely effective and still there may be some uh, viruses and other uh, things may be transmitted and there are one of the major concern is about this off target effect means it can sometime if it, it is not on target then it can actually cause inactivation of the other genes which are important and so these are the some of the uh, uh, some of the shortcoming of this method but it is continuing to develop rapidly and maybe this will come up uh, 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 in the future and we can actually use it in this uh, xenotransplantation another way to improve the supply of the organ is by bioengineering. Bioengineering means essentially you make organs uh, with the help of the techniques and by the way of bioprinting which I will explain. So what is bioengineering? So basically <coughs> uh, you need for the bioengineering means organs to be made you need a scaffold. A scaffold means you need a structure on which you can make you can seed the cells. This structure can either be uh, the normal organ which after the death of a person you can after uh, clearing this organ by decellularization you can clear the cells, you can use the matrix for the seeding of the cells. This is from the norm or what you can do you can print the organ by the help of 3D bioprinting which I will explain later on and once you uh, uh, obtain this organ for the uh, cell seeding you can seed the cell there are two sources of the cells either you can use embryonic stem cell because you need to uh, use the pluripotent cells pluripotent cells either come from the embryonic cells or uh, you can actually nowadays make the uh, pluripotent cells by the uh, certain factors which is called induced pluripotent cells and these cells then they convert into the various cell types. So you will seed these cells uh, in these organs or in the scaffold and put these in a bioreactor which is a uh, 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 this is a uh, reactor where you can actually provide the growth factor and other cytokines and other nutrients for the cells to grow or you can put these in directly into the uh, directly in vivo and once this organ is matured then you can actually transplant this organ into the into human beings and then then it can be used so this is actually many uh, of the uh, things are being done but it is now still for the complex organs like heart and liver and kidney this this is still uh, undergoing in the research but some of the simpler organs has been uh, actually uh, transplanted by this and uh, these are the some of the early uh, research in 1990 the first li living tissue grafts were created uh, based on these polymers and uh, uh, first uh, tracheal transplantation uh, with the help of the bioengineered trachea uh, went into 2004 and after that there are many organs like the especially the ears or the cartilage uh, that has been uh, actually transplanted means made artificially and put in the human. The one of the important advantage of uh, these uh, organs is that because you are taking the cells from the patient itself 
and you make the organs out of that, so per, per the person would not leave, uh, require any immunosuppression on long term basis. So that is a major advantage. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, there are two sources. Either you can use the human organs after the death of the patient or you can make the organs in the lab with the help of 3D bioprinting. So 3D bioprinting is a, actually a, a complex procedure. I will just try to explain in the brief. So what you do in this method that uh, first you obtain a medical imaging to actually either CT or MRI to get the 3D image, image of uh, organs and then you make a 3D model and put that into the computer and then this is called the 3D bioprinter in which you various tubes in uh, you place the cells and there is a material which is the uh, uh, synthetic that is called the uh, sacrilegial material and the cells are with the help of bio ink they are by layer by layer as you can see here layer by layer you can see the cells and this material which is the uh, uh, sacrilegial material which actually uh, uh, will uh, support these cells and at the end you can get this is the final product which you can get after the uh, printing bio printing this is a complex procedure and uh, uh, this needs uh, uh, for the paucity of time I'll, I'll, I'll just explain the principle so you can see this is the uh, bio ink in which the cells are there and then there is a bio paper gel layer by layer you create these cells and after this organs or this uh, structure is made this uh, bio paper is dissolved and which will leave the final tissue like that and these are the some of the actual uh, tissues which have been made this is a kidney, this is, uh, uh, this is the uh, kidneys has of course not been in the use and this is the ear and this is the cartilage which has been uh, uh, made, bone which has been made by bioprinting. So this is a significant actually advantage. Nowadays I see, uh, we keep on seeing in the papers about the bioprinting more and more. Uh, so one of the important uh, uh, aspect of uh, development of any organ is how do you get the stem cells as you know the adults do not have the capacity to regenerate the cells and you sh uh, can get the cells only from the embryonic stem cells in the embryonic uh, uh, embry from the embryos but getting the cells from the embryo is an ethical issue and you cannot use it for the uh, uh, you can on cannot always get it so one of the important discoveries has been the invention or the discovery of the induced pluripotent stem cells. So what are these cells? Basically, uh, this one of the uh, Japanese scientists called uh, Yamanaka discovered that uh, Yamanaka uh, found that there were some genes in the mouse embryo and he isolated these four genes and these cocktail of those genes were put into the skin of the mouse and he were skin cells of the mouse and he was able to make these cells into the pluripotent stem cells. So these pluripotent stem cells uh, once these are made uh, means you can uh, take any of cells of the body convert them into the pluripotent stem cells and after these cells are made, oh, you will put the, uh, the required growth factor and these cells can differentiate into any cell type of the body like blood cells, cartilage, cardiac, gut cells, kidney cells. So, so this is the one of the important discovery in the last uh, decade. And uh, he, Yamanaka, did this experiment in the rats and for that he got a Nobel Prize later on with the uh, uh, John Garden who also initiated a, a program of cell, cell programming. What about kidney? Uh, how uh, uh, we can actually create the kidney cells from this uh, uh, these induced pluripotent stem cell? 
So this work has been done by another uh, Japanese scientist, uh, Takasato. He found that if you take a sample of adult somatic cells and put these cells and put Yamanaka factors in these cells, you he was able to make induced pluripotent stem cells. And after putting the appropriate growth factor cocktail out of few weeks, these cells were converted into the intermediate mesodermal cells, which are the initial cell for the any kidney uh, 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 cells. Like these cells were later on uh, sub uh, uh, developed into ureteric bud epithelium and metanephric mesenchyme, which are actually essential, which are the uh, progenitor cells for the various type of the kidney. Uh, uh, nephron, various part of the nephrons and they were able to generate a kidney organoid which they named it as a kidney organoid which contained 500 nephrons. So obviously with 500 nephrons you cannot uh, actually uh, put these this into the work but you can immediately one can do the test of the test for the drugs for the nephrotoxic effect you need not to get a mice model uh, mice animal to test the nephrotoxic effect of the certain drugs. The another important use of this kidney organoid is that you can also see if there is a particular uh, gene in the kidney uh, has certain mutation and you can test the drugs whether they can treat this genetic type of kidney disease and the ultimate goal as I mentioned is the uh, prepare the organ for transplantation maybe maybe with further development you are able to make more and more nephron and use this organ for the transplantation. Recently this uh, article came into American Journal of Transplantation and the uh, they have uh, mentioned that NIH has lift, uh, lifted the moratorium on chimera research funding that is a significant uh, in the field of organ transplant because uh, in this uh, uh, now the you can put the human pluripotent cells into the mice embryo and you can develop an organ uh, which actually is a more like a human organ in the animal body and later on this organ can be transplanted into the humans. Obviously this is a initial uh, part the research will uh, develop the advantage of this would be the less antigenicity and maybe uh, less uh, chances of the rejection but obviously uh, there will be more chances of the mutation and development of viral genotic infection in these patients. So this is an important development recently mm. done and uh, uh, as I mentioned the transplant tolerance because uh, this is the uh, dream of every transplant uh, physician that uh, patient organ is transplanted and person does not need any immunosuppression after that and the, the this has been seen that the patients who some of the patient who stopped their drug and their organ was continued uh, to work and they found that the T regulatory cells they were uh, uh, in more in number in these patients. So these T regulatory cells have important role in transplant tolerance. So nowadays this uh, effort studies are going on in which the T regulatory cells they are isolated from peripheral blood and then the scientists expand them in ex vivo in, uh, in, in, in the lab and they inject the expanded cells product back into the patient. These cells how do we identify they have high surface CD25 and the nuclear uh, FOXP3 marker and low CD127. This technique is already used for the in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Uh, there is one study which is going on which is called UK1 study in which they recently uh, shown this result in transplant meeting and they treated 11 patients with these polyclonally expanded T regulatory cells and they, it was infused after the transplantation and in these patients there was no adverse event was seen and the, these patients showed excellent kidney graft function. Uh, there is a further research is going on that you can develop uh, the antigen specific T regulatory cells means sometime if donor specific antibodies are present in some person you can 
develop a T regulatory cell which is directed against a specific antigen so that the person does not develop rejection because of that antigen. However, there are certain concern of T regulatory cells. One of them is what immunosuppression these patients should receive, which is still not clear. Now, uh, still, uh, the most of these patients, they receive the standard immunosuppression with T regulatory cells. What is the risk of malignancy and viral infection? And uh, this is not an uh, easy thing. You require a big infrastructure and it's very costly. And sometimes these T regulatory cells, there's small number of CD8 cells, they are also mixed in that. What is the effect of that? And what immune monitoring you require once you stop immunosuppression? This is not very clear. So there are still, this is in experimental stage. The next uh, uh, important uh, aspect of the transplant is the rejection. And Biomarkers, as we know that in we mainly use in various fields, we is in field of uh, uh, cardiology, in the field of AKI, we use biomarkers to detect the early uh, uh, signs of rejection. So there are biomarkers of rejection which are being developed. As you know, that clinical presentation of a person is late. By the time the patient present with uh, some proteinuria or graft loss, or uh, IFTA, it's already late. And even if you do the kidney biopsy, protocol biopsy, you can get sometimes subclinical rejection or uh, subclinical uh, changes in the histopathology. But uh, this is not always possible to do. And the process has already been started. So the research is going, going on that before development of the even the morphological changes, with the help of the genetic markers transcriptome, we can uh, uh, actually guess whether this patient is likely to develop rejection or not. So this is a recent study which has been published in uh, July 2016 in Lancet by Philip O'Connell group in which what they have done that uh, they have prospectively studied 204 patients who were stable and they did a protocol biopsy in these patients starting from the three months of transplant at various time interval and then they did a repeat biopsy after six months and 12 months and at 12 months uh, this they actually uh, correlated with the genes which are associated with chronic allograft uh, damage index called CADI at 12 months. And they were able to identify a set of 13 genes who were associated with high uh, chronic activity disease index. And uh, when they compared this uh, genes as compared to the morphological parameters, clinical and patho, there were better correlation with the gene set as compared to the other like clinical and pathological variables and based only uh, baseline clinical variables. And they also find when they subdivided the patient according to the, the patient who had these uh, genes, genetic markers, their graft survival was lower as compared to the patient who were classified at low risk patient based on the uh, these gene profile. And the AUC for the graft survival, even after the two or three years, was, was uh, more than 0.8 in these patients. So, so that is the predictive of graft loss uh, in these patients. So, maybe further studies uh, will is required to confirm whether we can actually bring this these tests into the clinical practice. There's another genetic assay uh, which is a kidney solid organ response as test which is actually uh, is an assay to detect acute rejection so this again i am just uh, highlighting that uh, there are various uh, they have done various type of test this is a blood test in which you identify they identified 17 genes if if the patients have those genes they have high chances of rejection acute rejection and they have done various studies from training, then validation, cross-validation, and finally prediction studies. And one of the validation studies, they, they demonstrated that uh, they were able to 
correctly identify acute rejection in 22 out of 23 patients. So they only miss one patient, so which has very high AUC of 0.94. And they similarly in the patient who did not develop acute rejection, only one patient, so 100 out of 101 patient, they were able to correctly identify uh, who did not have rejection. <coughs> so this is uh, one of the recent uh, publication and the uh, about the new molecule in the uh, kidney transplant is the co-stimulatory blockage. Uh, although this is not so new, but uh, uh, there is a recent uh, paper which has been published in New England Journal of Medicine about seven years outcome. I will just discuss briefly about that. As we know that uh, uh, co-stimulatory blockers, they are second signal for the activation of the T cells and one of the molecule is the uh, co-stimulatory molecule is uh, uh, CTLA4 CD28 which when combined with CD80 the CD28 activate the T cells and CTLA4 when it combines it inhibit the activity activation of the T cells and the T cells will go into energy but uh, uh, and this bilatacept is a uh, CTLA4 fusion protein, which is a second generation CTLA4 fusion protein. And as I said, this was a benefit study, and the recently seven year result of this study has been published. And this has shown that in this the original study, there were three arms one is the blattercept, uh, uh, more intensive, second is blattercept, less intensive, and third was cyclosporin arm. So in both blattercept more intensive and the less in intensive arm, the combound, combined outcome of the patient or graft survival was better as compared to the patients who were on cyclosporine. So there was at seven years. So 43% improvement in the overall uh, ratio of death or graft loss as compared to the patients on cyclosporine. And the, how were the acute rejection rates were slightly higher in these patients in the, uh, so uh, patients in graft loss was 12% in uh, latacept arm as compared to 21% in cyclosporin. The biopsy proven acute rejection were higher in latacept arm. Uh, when they compared the GFR at seven years, they see the GFR was better since beginning from, but at the end of these uh, seven years, there was uh, improvement in the GFR, further improvement at 84 months, GFR was about 70 ml in the blattercept arm and only 50 ml in cyclosporin arm. So it was definitely better in preserving of the preservation of GFR. So this is a very important observation because these are the long term results and uh, uh, this may be uh, useful and one of the important concern with blattercept has been development of PTLD post transplant lymphoproliferative proliferative disorder um, but uh, after 24 months there was no difference in PTLD in blattercept and one of the important uh, advantage was seen that there was less DSA was seen in blattercept both the blattercept arm as compared to cyclosporin. Uh, so, so, so uh, uh, however, there are certain issues with blattercept that it requires a monthly infusion and uh, some say it may be beneficial because patients are less compliant, non-compliant if they are coming to the hospital to get the injection every month. It is a costly drug. Uh, very important thing is it has not been compared with tacrolimus, which is the standard of treatment for uh, transplantation nowadays. It has been not uh, tested in pediatric population or sensitized patient. And one of the important advantages is that uh, uh, monitoring of the levels are not required with Pilatoset. However, as I said, the rejection rates are higher. Uh, that is because there are many other co-stimulatory pathways which are operating and in blocking one pathway activate the other pathways and there are many other drugs which are being developed but these are all being uh, under experimental stage and mainly in the animals where the experiments are going on. 
lastly i'll just briefly mention about the one or two important drugs which have is come up in kidney transplantation and especially in the acute rejection antibody mediated rejection uh, as we know that uh, complement is a very important uh, in rejection so this is a study by Lupi et al., which has been published in New England Journal in 2013, which he has shown that the patients who have uh, non specific antibodies with complement, C1Q positivity, they have worse graft survival as compared to the patient who were either DSA negative or DSA positive without complement. It shows the importance of the complement and the complement inhibitor which we use which is in use is uh, the acluzumab which is in the clinical use which is actually inhibitor of C5 and that is the and in with the formation of uh, membrane attack complex so this act quite uh, uh, late into the uh, complement sequence so uh, this complement one inhibitor which is called C1 estrase inhibitor uh, this is a new drug. This actually, this drug is already used in patient with hereditary angioedema for last many years. And this inhibit this initial component uh, of the complement, classic component, and does not affect the alternative pathway. So, advantage of this drug is that obviously that immunity, alternative pathway immunity is, is spared, and the patient does not develop serious infection like Neisseria, which is seen with the use of acalizumab and the, it only affects the complement called classical complement pathway. Uh, so this is one of the uh, study which has been published last year is the use of C1 inhibitor in acute uh, antibody mediated rejection which was non-responsive to conventional therapy in transplant recipient. So these patients after receiving, receiving the initial standard treatment of uh, AMR that is plasma pharesis, rituximab and IBIG uh, and still they had very high DSA and morphological changes. They received this uh, C1 inhibitor that is Berinert uh, 20 units per kg for three days and then twice weekly uh, with IVIG. And the primary endpoint of the study was the uh, estimated GFR. And uh, uh, the all patient, they showed an improvement in GFR at the end of six months in uh, this arm, however, there was no change in the histological features except for decrease in C4D deposition rate in five of six patients who received uh, uh, Benerit. Uh, this is another study which has been also published last year. In this, actually, uh, Montgomery and other uh, his group they used this. Uh, uh, drug for the AMR in uh, they gave this uh, uh, drug in nine patients and compared with the placebo after the standard treatment and however there was no difference in the uh, graft survival or the pathology however in some of the patient seven patient out of nine mm, uh, transplant glomerulopathy was not seen and the three of these placebo they had transplant glomerulopathy. So this shows that there is some uh, not results are not very promising, but at least there is some improvement in the GFR or there's less incidence of transplant glomerulopathy with use of these agents. The further uh, uh, the, uh, the studies are going on with this agent. Another agent which has been in uh, talk uh, nowadays is the uh, tocilizumab, which is an interleukin-6 inhibitor. Interleukin-6 is a cytokine which actually is responsible for the uh, production of antibody with P stimulation of B and P cells and plasma cells. And uh, the main work on this is being done by uh, Dr. Jordan from CDSNI and he had published this uh, initial result of the interleukin-6 inhibitors in patients who were difficult to desensitize. And uh, he used this drug in 10 patients who were unresponsive to the standard treatment with IVIG and rituximab. And uh, he, he gave this drug at uh, initially uh, on day 15 and then monthly infusion along with IVIG 
and he was able to transplant five of these patients and one of these patients developed acute uh, AMR at one year, not at six months and uh, uh, rest of the patients were doing well and there was no uh, rejection at six months in these patients and as you can see that uh, there was a significant reduction in the DSA at the end of uh, at, at transplant and at the end of 12 months and the IL-6 levels were higher because of course because of the blockage of IL-6 receptors and the, he concluded that tocilizumab along with IVID appears to be safe in the patients to, uh, who are difficult to desensitize. With that I'll just uh, conclude my talk. Thank you very much for patience.